Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church. Let me open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us, this beautiful weather that we're able to enjoy. Father, this opportunity that we have to be able to come together and hear your word being preached. We also pray for Adventure Club uh, that will happen later this evening. And we pray for those kids, those workers. We're thankful for the fruit that we have been seeing in that ministry, and we pray that that would continue by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be faithful. Help us to seek to be good examples of your Son, Jesus Christ, to those little ones. And I pray that the lessons uh, would be taught uh, accurately and that they would be received by the children and that the teaching would lay seeds of salvation um, in their hearts. And Father, we pray for the lesson now that we will receive about spiritual gifts. I pray that you help us to understand and, and hear and and believe and apply the things that are being taught to us that the body of Christ may be edified. And Father, we give thanks and we pray that you receive all the glory. And we lift these things up in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're going to get into 1 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 14 tonight, the last of the, the trilogy of chapters dealing with spiritual gifts in this book. So for review, we've seen chapter 12 where he gives the perspective on spiritual gifts, what they are, what they're all about. Uh, because the Corinthians' perspective was a little bit off. They were focusing mostly on the gifts and the spectacular gifts instead of what they were for. So they needed to have their perspective straightened out. Verse or Chapter 13, he talks about the attitude with which they should exercise the gifts, which is one of love. And then in chapter 14, he gets into the practice. How do you incorporate the use of spiritual gifts into the church service. And again, this is where, where the Corinthians needed some correction because they were all over the place in their, their use of the gifts. They were focusing on the more spectacular ones as we discussed before, tongues and healings and miracles and things like that. And Paul points out, especially here in chapter 14, that that's not really what matters. What matters is building the church up spiritually. And you don't do that through those spectacular gifts. You do that through the edifying gifts. <clears throat> so if you have that chart with you that I mentioned before, covering the three chapters, we're going to look at the section... For chapter 14. I have it up on the screen there. This is just 14. We're going to read that uh, highlighted part. That's kind of a summary of what chapter 14 is all about. So it'll tell us what's coming and get us prepared mentally for Paul's point. So if you have that chart with you, you can probably see it better than you can from the screen. But... <clears throat> It says, uh, having shown the centrality of love to the exercise of spiritual gifts, that was chapter 13, Paul resumes his discussion of the gifts themselves. That was chapter 12. So basically, chapter 13 is kind of a parenthesis or an interruption in the discussion of gifts. But we'll see why it was essential. It uh, goes on, he summarizes the gifts into two basic categories, those that edify, for example, prophecy, and those that are spectacular, for example, tongues. So he mentions just those two gifts, prophecy and tongues, but he does that as a symbol for the rest of them. 
All of the gifts are incorporated in those two groups. Okay. Uh, let's see, it says, after reminding them that the gifts that edify are universally applicable, while the spectacular have only personal application, he goes on to demonstrate this by showing the nature and purpose of the gifts. He tells the Corinthians how to conduct themselves in the assembly, reminds them of his apostolic authority, and declares that true spirituality is demonstrated by obedience to that authority. It's not demonstrated based on the gift that you have. It's based on how much you obey God. And finally, he gives them a standard of balance to apply in the exercise of their spiritual gifts. So that's what chapter 14 is all about. Okay, so he's, he's getting very practical. Chapter 12 was the principle. Chapter 13 was the attitude. And now chapter 14 is the how-to, the practice. <clears throat> So we'll start with chapter 14, verses 1 to 19, the first paragraph. We may not get through this paragraph tonight. We shall see. But again, on the screen there, I've got the, this highlighted. That first paragraph deals with the centrality of mutual edification. And the more important gifts are those, those that edify, which takes us back to chapter 12 and verse 31. And the spectacular gifts may not help the body all that much. Okay. That's essentially what he says in those first 19 verses. Now, this is a long paragraph, so we're not going to read it all at once. Uh, we'll, we'll read it as we go along. <clears throat> so basically, we're into chapter 14, which is how to exercise spiritual gifts in the church. And he's focusing in chapter 14 on the group, on the assembly, because if you go back to chapter 12, he made the point that all of the gifts are essential for the benefit of everybody. So he's focusing here on the everybody. So in verse things a little bit more, this is a continuation from chapter 12. It's a chiasm. Chapter 12, verse 31, is the first half of the chiasm. You remember the chiasm is like an X. And chapter 14, verse 1, is the second half of the chiasm. So this is a way for him to tie those two chapters together. Where he ends chapter 12, he begins chapter 14, which shows the parenthetical nature of chapter 13. It comes right in the middle of this discussion of spiritual gifts. So he uses this chiasm to tie things together. And, and so chapter 12 and verse 31 is the first part. And then we have chapter 14, verse 1 as the second part. In 1231... Uh, notice what he says there, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. So he tells them the first thing, the first part of the chiasm is to desire these greater gifts. And we define greater as meaning those that are more in line with what spiritual gifts are all about, which is the edification of the church. And the second part of verse 31, he says there's even something more important than seeking the greater gifts. And that's love, and that's what chapter 13 is all about. Okay. So he talks about love in chapter 13, then he gets to chapter 14, and know how, notice how chapter 14 begins, pursue love. That's chapter 13, he just said that. So he's reminding them, chapter 13, pursue love, and he finishes that chiasm by saying, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So chapter 12 uh, ends and chapter 14 picks up right where it ends. He finishes the thought. And that's an introduction into his expansion on everything he said in chapter 12. 
So if we want to, if we want to put these these chapters together into a coherent sequence, you could almost look at these three chapters as a seesaw or teeter-totter in, in the playground. Chapter 12 and chapter 14 are the ends, and chapter 13 is the pivot point in the middle. What he says about spiritual gifts in chapters 12 and 14 is balanced on what he says in chapter 13 about the attitude in expressing the gifts, which is an attitude of love. And this chiasm helps us to see that the balance in, in this whole discussion. Does that make sense? Okay. So then we have a categorization of the gifts. He talks about tongues, uh, which were the demonstrative gifts, the flashy ones. And these were the Corinthians' priorities. This was the problem. They were focused on the flashiness of the gift rather than on the content of what the gift was supposed to accomplish. And then you have prophecy, which are the edifying gifts, and that's God's priority. <clears throat> and he's going to spend chapter 14 by showing that the Corinthians' priority on the spectacular gifts is not God's priority, and they need to adjust their focus. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that brings us then to the criterion for defining the greater gifts. And that's basically the question, which edifies the most? The greater gifts are those that edify. The whole point of spiritual gifts is to bring the body of Christ to maturity. Ephesians 4 is the classic uh, passage on that. We cited that last time. <clears throat> as every member of the body exercises his or her gift for everybody else's benefit, the church grows spiritually. The church matures. Okay. So it's all focused then on edification. Without, without the edification, you're wasting your time. Because <laughs> it's all about edification. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we want to spend some time <clears throat> setting up a contrast between tongues and prophecy. This is what Paul does in the first few verses of chapter 14. He's trying to lay the groundwork as to what really matters. And of course, it's different from what the Corinthians thought mattered. So we're looking at verses 2 through 4 specifically. We've already looked at verse 1, the second half of the chiasm. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And then he goes on to explain why they need to focus on Prophecy, and again, prophecy is a category of gifts, those gifts that <clears throat> teach, that expound on the word, the gifts that clarify, the gifts that give people understanding of what God is saying. That's edification. Edification doesn't come without the, the mind being involved. And Paul makes that point throughout the chapter. Okay, and he repeats over and over again. He says kind of the same thing in different ways, sometimes exactly the same ways <laughs> throughout the chapter, and we'll see that. We'll get a preview here in a minute. So um, we have a... <clears throat> I'm going to take some time on 2 through 4. Let's go ahead and read those verses. So verse 1 says, Seek to prophesy especially, and verse 2 explains why. It starts with the word for, which means because. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. 
One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So right away, he sets his priorities. The edification is what matters. Tongues do not edify, is what he's saying. Prophecy does. So he lays that foundation right away. And I have the chart there, that half page, um, to illustrate this. I'm going to put this up on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me again. It starts with this little introductory comment. It says, Paul prepares for his explanation of the superiority of edification gifts to demonstrative gifts in chapter 14 by contrasting the two kinds of gifts. He shows that the Corinthians' emphasis on the demonstrative gifts was misplaced since those gifts lead only to limited benefit to individuals, whereas the edification gifts lead to benefits for the whole church. Based on that contrast, he continues through the chapter by explaining in detail what, is, what he said in chapter 12 about the gifts being for mutual, not personal benefit. <clears throat> the Corinthians need to adopt the proper perspective on gifts and use them for their intended purpose. So the following chart then shows Paul's contrast of the two kinds of gifts. So on the screen here, the chart is mostly blank. Unfortunately, the handout's already filled in, so <laughs> you don't get the mental exercise. <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> Excuse me. So across the top, we have a title there. It's the contrast of tongues and prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, 2 to 4. We have two main columns, one for tongues and one for prophecy. And then we have the verses where he talks about those two, and then we have the focus for those gifts, and then we have the effect or the result of those gifts. So let's go back to verse 2. He says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for, one, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. And then verse 4, the first part, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So what is the focus for tongues? It's private. The person who has the gift of speaking in tongues ministers mostly to himself. And Paul will expand on this throughout the chapter. And what is the effect? Verse 2 says, uh, One who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands. <laughs> There's no understanding here. In fact, the person who has the gift of speaking in another language may not understand what he says himself. Okay. Paul says that's not helpful. Right. And then for the edification, chapter or verse 4, the, part, the first part says, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So there's self-edification. So the primary weakness with tongues when it comes to the function of spiritual gifts is that it doesn't do the job. Now Paul does say, and we'll see as we go through the chapter, there is some benefit to the gift of tongues. It is, after all, a spiritual gift that God gave to the church to use for edification. So there is some value to it. But in general, it's not very good <laughs> at accomplishing that value, at accomplishing that purpose. As for prophecy, the second group there, verse 3 says, one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. And the end of verse 4, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So this focus is public. The person who prophesies is proclaiming God's word to people. It's not an internal thing. It's an external thing. And the effect then is edification, exhortation, consolation. Those are all practical things that people can use. This, these are elements within spiritual growth. And you can see how they relate to the different edification or the different uh, prophecy kind of gifts. Edification, that's building up. The word edify in 
Greek means to build a house, literally, a house builder. <clears throat> Even today we use that concept. You know, another word for a building is an edifice, something that is built. Okay. So this is spiritual structuring, is what edification is all about. Edification comes from preaching primarily and teaching. Teaching and preaching, there's some overlap there. Uh, exhortation comes primarily from preaching. And consolation has a double, double emphasis there. One is comfort, to console someone. The other is encouragement, like keep at it. Okay? That, that goes along with exhortation. But you can see how these fit those prophecy kind of gifts, teaching and preaching. Okay. And what is the, um, the effect for the edification? Well, he says in verse 4, at the end, the church is edified. The whole group is edified. So tongues have a limited application, primarily to the one who exercises the gift. Now, it does have benefit to other people, as Paul explains later, but only under certain circumstances. So Paul essentially is saying, when it comes to the use of tongues in the church, you have to be careful how you do it. You want to get the maximum benefit from it, but to do that, you have to exercise some controls. Charismatics don't like that. <laughs> they think that this is the Spirit speaking, so when the Spirit speaks, you've got to follow. <laughs> you can't say no. Paul says, where did you ever get that idea? <laughs> there have to be controls. There are also controls for prophecy, for the preaching and the teaching ministries, the exercise of those gifts. Now, this kind of sets up what he says throughout the rest of the chapter. And as I said, throughout the rest of the chapter, he repeats this contrast between tongues and, and prophecy. You know, prophecy nowadays, when people talk about prophesying, it's more like telling what's going to happen in the future. It's kind of not the original definition, like you just mentioned, proclamation of these words, but that's not how people use it these days. Yes, right. Well, it does mean both, really. If you go back to the Old Testament, the prophets. You know, the prophets were foretelling the future. Okay? Basically, I'll let you in on a little secret here. All the prophets had the same message. <laughs> they all said the same thing. Different circumstances, but the point was the same. They're all telling Israel, well, in some cases, like in Ezekiel, he's giving prophecies against surrounding nations, the nations surrounding Israel. But primarily, they were speaking to Israel. And the message was, you guys are blowing it. <laughs> You're in trouble. And if you don't straighten up, God's going to judge you. And you're going to be kicked out of the land. Go back to, to Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29. As long as you do what I tell you to do and don't do what I tell you not to do, you will be safe and secure and prosperous in the land. But if you don't do that, you're out of there because it's my land, not yours. If you mess it up, you can't be there anymore. Well, we'll get there. And we'll get there later in the chapter. Yeah, you're right. Tongues have value if they are interpreted, and we'll see how that works out when we get on into the chapter later on. So the prophets in the Old Testament did foretell the future. And another part of that foretelling was that God would restore Israel. He's going to judge them for their sin, but eventually he would restore them. All the prophets have that same message. And that involves foretelling the future. And so we get the idea these days that prophecy is about telling things that are going to happen. But the word is also used to simply mean to speak forth the word of God. People do a play on words there. It's not foretelling, it's telling forth. 
All right. But both, both definitions apply. But when we get to spiritual gifts, we're talking primarily about proclaiming the word in a forceful, emphatic way. Okay. That's essentially the difference between teaching and preaching. Teaching is simply explaining. Preaching is saying, you got to do something about this. <laughs> right. That's the primary difference. <clears throat> <clears throat> so what I want to do next is uh, continue this thought, this contrast between tongues and prophecy throughout the rest of the chapter. Because as I said, he continues this contrast. He repeats quite a bit. Okay? So I put together, I, I put together another chart that um, expands this idea throughout the chapter. Okay. So we're talking primarily here about the limitations of tongues for edification. All right. We just saw uh, a little bit of that in the first few verses. Gifts of prophecy are good for edifying. Gifts, the gift of tongues is not. Okay, so now we're going to, sh to expand on the idea that the tongues are not effective for edification throughout the rest of the chapter. So this is kind of a sneak peek at what's coming, and then we'll go back and hit the details as we go through. So it starts with this little introduction again. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul gives concrete instructions regarding how spiritual gifts are to be incorporated in the church service. His instructions are based on the relative effectiveness of the various gifts in accomplishing the edification of the saints. He begins in the first five verses of chapter 14 by contrasting the gift of tongues, gifts of tongues in prophecy, symbolizing the more spectacular gifts and the gifts that edify, respectively, making the point that the, gifts of, the gift of tongues has a limited capacity to accomplish edification and so should not be given priority among the gifts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul continues this contrast throughout the chapter, repeating the rel relative value of the gifts as he establishes a balanced approach to incorporating the use of gifts in, wor in the worship service for maximum edification and minimum disturbance. The following chart summarizes Paul's justification for prioritizing the gifts as he does. There's one little caveat there. We're using the word tongues here in a generic sense of a known language that God enables one who does not know that language to speak. Now, there are different definitions and interpretations of tongues, and it's not the purpose of our study to go into that kind of detail. But if you take a look at what Paul says here and how he says it, he clearly understands tongues to be languages, human languages. So the person who speaks in a tongue is speaking a human language, but it's a language that perhaps the other people in the church don't understand. And maybe he himself doesn't understand. He has, you know, God gives him the ability to speak that language, but he has no idea what he's saying. This is why Paul says later, don't do that unless there's someone in the congregation who can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, it's pointless. Okay. And we'll see how we, that works out when we get there. So then we have the, uh, the chart. So across the top again, we have the, the title there, the limitations of tongues for edification, and then we have the different verses throughout this chapter where he shows the limitations and then the meaning of those phrases that he uses and then the overall application. So we've already read verse 2. <clears throat> he has three basic points there. Uh, the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. And no one understands what he's saying. Uh, 
and in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Now we need to take a little bit of a step back here. If you go over to 13 and verse 2, where Paul is showing the centrality of love, he says in verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, as we discussed when we looked at that verse, the word mystery in that context means something, a new idea, something that has been hidden and is now being revealed. Paul says that in Ephesians 2. He's talking to the Gentiles and the fact that the Gentiles are now brought into the kingdom along with the Jews. He says, this is a mystery, meaning nobody knew this before. I'm giving you something new here, some new information. Uh, he calls it the mystery of Christ in you, the Gentiles, the hope of glory. Nobody knew that before. That's, that's the, the theological definition of a mystery. Okay. But over in chapter 14 in verse 2, when he says he speaks mysteries, he's not talking about those kinds of mysteries. He's talking about things that people don't understand. It's a mystery to me. Like, I don't get it. And the reason he says that is because he's speaking a language that nobody understands. And he himself may not understand. So it's a mystery. It's a puzzle. I don't get it. Okay. I've got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, if the someone is speaking in tongues, how can we be sure that he's speaking to that? We'll get to that as we continue in the chapter. So hang on to that thought. <laughs> we'll get there. But that's the kind of question that is intriguing, but it's not really the kind of question we have time to delve into. In fact, I should say that at the very beginning of chapter 14, because he gets into some issues that are controversial from a theological point of view. But our focus in this study, as we discussed at the very beginning, is, is practical. Identifying what the gifts are, helping people understand what their gift is, and figuring out how they can apply it in the church. That's our goal. We're not, we don't really have time to get into those esoteric discussions of what is this and what is that and how does this work out and all of that stuff. If you want answers to those questions, read a book. Because <laughs> we're not going to have time to get into all of that. It kind of reminds me of Paul's advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy. He tells Timothy, don't get sidetracked into all of these detailed discussions about you know, this, what does this mean, what does that mean. He says those are not profitable discussions. You don't know any more about it when you finish than you did when you started. So stick to what matters, and in First Timothy is godliness. Okay, stick to what matters. So the focus of our study is, is too limited for us to get into a lot of those, those discussions and explanations. <clears throat> so, verse 2 again. Uh, the person who speaks in a tongue, that is a language that other people don't understand, is not speaking to people. If he's speaking to anybody, he's speaking to God because God's the only one who knows what he's saying. Nobody else does. Therefore, no one understands. In his spirit, he's speaking mysteries. He's, he's, what he's saying is not clear to anybody, probably not even to himself. And verse 9 the same thing, he says, if you come in speaking a language that nobody understands, you're going to be speaking into the air. It's as though nobody is there because nobody knows what you're talking about. You might as well be out on the beach talking to nothing. <laughs> Essentially what he's saying, you'll be talking to the air. And then verse 16, uh, referring to the person who doesn't understand the language, he says, he does not know what you're saying. So what is the meaning of all of these statements, the middle column there? Uh, the one who speaks in tongues is not communicating with people because they don't know what he's saying. In fact, he himself may not know what he is saying. He is, in effect, talking into the air. The only one who could possibly understand him is God, but that doesn't accomplish edification of the body. So speaking in the tongues in the church service doesn't do anybody any good. Paul is saying. 
Now, later on, he will say, unless you have somebody who can interpret it. But that's not his point now. His point now is saying, this is a huge weakness in using tongues in the church service. <clears throat> Continue, verse 17. Uh, he makes the point that the other man is not edified. The one who doesn't understand the language you're speaking has no idea what you're talking about, so he gets no spiritual benefit from what you're saying. And the meaning of that is basically that. As a result, no one is edified when someone speaks in a tongue. If you speak in a language that no one understands, no one's going to be edified. No one's going to get any spiritual benefit from that. Uh, verse 27, three more statements he makes. This is the limitations in using tongues. First of all, if, if you are going to use tongues in the church service, Paul says, it shouldn't be more than two or three people in the whole church service for however long the church service lasts. Shouldn't be more than two or three. They should speak in turn, not all at once. And there should be someone there to interpret And verse 28 says, if there's no one there to interpret, then don't speak in the tongue. Because <laughs> it's not going to do anybody any good. So we have the, the meaning there in the middle column. Uh, because of the limited benefit of tongues to the church, speaking in tongues in the assembly should be limited. If there is no one to clarify a message that comes through a tongue, no one should speak in a tongue. Now I need to stop and define terms here because I've seen people misunderstand this. <clears throat> when he talks about interpreting, he's not talking about translating. I'm in the middle of reading a book now about this issue. And the guy doesn't make this distinction. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> and this guy's smart. <laughs> he's smarter than I am. But he keeps talking about these, the gift of tongues. Well, I don't want to go into his take on it. We'll get to it a little later in the study. Um, but uh, he uses the idea of translation rather than interpretation. If you come into the church service and start speaking a language that nobody understands... You need someone there who understands that language, who can translate it. But that's not interpretation. That's not what he's talking about. Interpretation has to do with conveying the meaning. The word interpret in Greek is the word from which we get the word hermeneutics. Hermeneuo is the word which means to explain the meaning. Okay? So he's not saying you need someone to translate this unknown language into a known language. He's saying you need somebody to explain the message. Taking it out of that original language and perhaps paraphrasing, putting it into a language they do understand. That's not translation. That's interpretation. That's meaning. So a person gets up and speaks in a foreign language and no one in the church understands somebody else in the church says I know what he said <laughs> I've got the gift of interpretation and so he said the message he just gave us is and he gives the message he doesn't translate he gives the point of the message that's interpretation so that's what Paul is after here if there's nobody who can tell you what the message said then you don't need to hear that message because it's not going to mean anything to you. So this again kind of goes against the way the charismatics do things, you know. When the Spirit moves, you've got to obey. Paul says, no, <laughs> there, there are limitations here. You've got to follow the rules. And, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Finally, the last phrase in verse 28, the one who speaks in a tongue, he says, speaks to himself and to God. If there's no one there who understands that language, then the person who's speaking that language isn't talking to anybody. He's talking to himself and to God. That doesn't do the church any good. So Paul would say, be quiet. 
Think about it in your own mind, in your own heart. So we have the, uh, the meaning there in that middle column. So instead of speaking this language without an interpreter, instead the one who speaks in a tongue should commune with God privately and not confuse the assembly with an indecipherable message. And this takes us up to verse 33, if we can skip ahead a little bit. Uh, he says there, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So Paul says what we need here to have a productive and edifying church service is for everything to be done peacefully. You don't want chaos. You don't, don't want all these people speaking in different languages at the same time, especially if nobody has any idea what they're saying. That doesn't accomplish anything positive. So then the application part here, the right-hand column, what is all this, uh, what is the outcome of all this? It says there, since the purpose of spiritual gifts is mutual edification of all the members of the body, and the gift of tongues has limited capacity to edify the assembly, that gift should be used sparingly and under tight restrictions. Only then can the gifts that are more suited to group edification be free to function according to God's purposes. If the people who speak in tongues are not speaking in tongues because there's nobody there to interpret, then the people who have the edifying gifts, the teachers, the preachers, they have the opportunity to explain things, to clarify. And as Paul goes on to say throughout the chapter, if your mind is not engaged, edification is not happening. So you may have an emotional experience by speaking in a language, but that's not edification. That doesn't do the body any good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any questions about any of that? Um, let's see. We'll get our set up for the next discussion here. We're still basically in verses 1 through 5 where he's talking about the relative effectiveness of tongues and prophecy. We haven't read chapter 5 or verse 5 yet. Um, well, actually, let's go back to verse 4. There's one, one word we need to define. And that's the word edify. Verse 4 says, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. The one who prophesies edifies the church. We've got the same word used twice in that short context. But they mean different things. <laughs> Paul's point throughout this chapter, and we'll see it as we go through, is that real edification, spiritual growth, has to involve the mind. If you're not thinking about this, if you're not meditating, if you're not focusing on what the message is saying, you're not, you're not growing. You're not being edified. Okay? But at the same time, he has just said in these verses that tongues don't do that. So how can a person then who speaks in tongues edify himself if his mind is not involved? which is the point. <laughs> You're speaking a language that you yourself don't even understand. How are you possibly engaging the thoughts in that language when you don't even know what you're saying? So how can he be edifying himself? We have to go back and kind of read between the lines here and talk about language in general. This is a principle that we are all familiar with, uh, but Sometimes when we get stuck in a particular context, we stop thinking <laughs> in the bigger picture. <clears throat> every word in every language on earth 
has more than one meaning. Every word has what's called the denotative meaning. That's the dictionary definition. You look the word up in the dictionary and that's what it means. That's kind of a universal basic definition. But every word also have, has connotative meanings. Connotative meanings go along with the context. The way a word is used in context impacts the meaning. For example, take this sentence, and I use this, this sentence back when we talked about, I think, hermeneutics and maybe also apologetics. Just listen to this sentence. One hot summer night, Bill put on his hot new suit, jumped in his hot car, picked up his hot girlfriend, went to a hot party where they had a hot time. The word hot is used six times in that sentence, and each time it means something different. It starts with the denotative meaning, one hot summer night. That's temperature. That's what hot means, hot as opposed to cold. But all of the rest of the uses in that sentence were connotative meanings, meanings based on the context. A hot new suit, you know, latest style. A hot car, really fancy, you know. A hot girlfriend, very attractive. A hot party, a lot of things going on there. A hot time, they really enjoyed themselves. Okay. Same words, six different meanings. We have the same thing going on here. <laughs> when the person who speaks in a, in a foreign language that nobody else understands speaks in that language, he is edifying himself not in the denotative sense of edification, meaning spiritual insight and growth, but in the connotative meaning of getting some kind of response from exercising that gift. And you know if you have identified your gift and if you if, have been using your gift, you know that when you use your gift the way God wants you to use it, the right way, the right time, the right place, the right attitude, you feel good about that. You go away thinking, that was a good time. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That's what this edifying means. The person who speaks in the tongue edifies himself in the sense that he gets that sense of connection with God. You know, things are happening here with God. But it's not spiritual edification. It's not the edification of the church. Okay? It's an emotional thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That goes along with using your gifts. Now, the, the caveat, the warning is, if you ever start to use your spiritual gift just to get that good feeling, it's over. <laughs> You're not going to get that good feeling because God's going to say, I'm not going to bless you. <laughs> You're not using your gift properly. Not for the right reasons. You're doing it for yourself. So you don't get anything for that. But there's nothing wrong, you know, ask any teacher, any preacher, after they finish a good lesson, they think that was great. <laughs> Not bragging or anything, but they get the sense that something was accomplished there. This was good. You know, I enjoyed that. Let's do it again. <laughs> where are you going to be in the next five minutes? <laughs> you get to the point where all you want to do is exercise your gift <laughs> because of the way you feel when you exercise your gift. So that's the difference here. The person who speaks in the tongue may get a sense of connection with God out of that, but nobody is being spiritually matured through that exercise, not even the person who exercises the gift. So there are differences in meaning here between this, the uses of this same word, edify. Okay. <clears throat> So his point throughout this chapter is tongues do not edify the body. They do not contribute to the spiritual maturity of the body unless there's someone there who can interpret. Whereas the prophecy gifts, teaching and preaching and expounding and all of that stuff, they do produce spiritual growth in the body because you're engaging the mind. People are thinking. 
people are contemplating what Scripture is saying. And the Spirit is using that (laughs) to convict them and to instruct them, to improve them. That spiritual growth. Okay. Um, Let's finish up in verse 5. Just to wrap this up. This is funny. Verse 5 says, Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues. (laughs) I bet he did. (laughs) If they all spoke in tongues, he wouldn't be having this problem. They were making the distinction. The people who spoke in tongues were thinking their gift was better than everybody else's. So Paul is thinking, if you all spoke in tongues, you wouldn't be making this distinction. However, given what we know about the Corinthian church based on the whole book, they would probably figure out something else to (laughs) to make a distinction about, even if they all spoke in tongues. But anyway, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. Here we're back to verse 1. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you prophesy. Because that's where, the, that's where the edification comes in. That's where maturity comes in. And he continues, And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. There again, edifying means spiritual growth, insight into Scripture, okay, into truth. So he wraps up this distinction, this contrast between tongues and prophecy by saying it would be good if you all spoke in tongues, but it's more important that you all prophesy. If you have to choose, choose prophecy. Because he's, you know, he said in chapter 12, you don't choose, God chooses. You get the gift that God wants you to have. It's your job to use it as he directs. But if you want to choose, if you're in a position, if you were in a position to choose, focus on prophecy. Because that's what the gifts are all about. Bringing spiritual maturity to the church. So that brings us then to the beginning of the next section in this first paragraph. We're still in verses 1 to 19. Um, But verses 6 through 12 then give the rationale for favoring gifts that edify. He tells him in verse 5, if you're going to seek gifts, seek edification, not tongues. And now he explains why in verses 6 through 12. And that's where we will pick up next week. Okay. Any observations, comments about any of that? We're way over time. Sorry about that. Uh, let's close in prayer. Our Father, again, we thank you for the clarification you bring to your word. We thank you that you give us your word in the first place, and we thank you that you give us the spirit to make it make sense to us. We pray that you will enable us to understand what you're saying here about the relative value of the different gifts and how we should exercise gifts in the church for your purposes and for each other's benefit. In Jesus' name, amen.